is called surveillance self-defense. And I'll let folks introduce themselves. But um, we all happen to work at a local nonprofit organization called EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, what, what we're going to talk about today is really uh, not representing our organization. We're just going to give you some thoughts um, and our own personal advice. Uh, so it's all our own opinions. And uh, certainly it's not legal advice either, because we're not, we're not your attorney, so we can't give you legal advice. Uh, if you want legal advice about anything, you should find an attorney and talk to them. Uh, so yeah, my name is Mark, and and my name is Nadia. I also work at the EFF. Um, I also do legal support with the National Lawyers Guild. I leave. I work at the EFF, um, and I like being thirteen. <laughs> uh, I'm Cooper. I don't work. I'm the techie scum who should die, um, and I'm a I don't know security hobbyist. Awesome. So. Uh, we're gonna have Nadia kind of set the stage and give us some context for what we're talking about. So I'm gonna talk about um, two pieces of context. One is the criminal defense context and one is the surveillance state context. So um, this report that I have up here, I just had to put up because it's so ridiculous. This is a report from a fusion center. Can anybody who's heard of a fusion center raise your hands? Oh, I love this crowd. Um, so for anybody who has not heard of a fusion center, um, who here has heard of Edward Snowden? Okay, awesome. And the NSA, right? Okay, great. So a lot of people hear about surveillance at this sort of removed um, national level. You're hearing about these federal agencies that are surveilling people. You hear a lot about surveillance of phone calls and emails that involve people that are in other countries. Um, which should matter to you also. Um, but you know, you're hearing about it and it seems sort of far away. So I just want to tell you that it is not far away. I actually always like to ask this question, how many people here have ever been called paranoid? Right. Okay, awesome. So um, the good news is that you're not paranoid. The bad news is that the surveillance that's happening is real and it probably affects you. So fusion centers, um, I just like to talk about fusion centers because there's something that happens at a far more local level. Um, I'm sure that many people here heard about the Domain Awareness Center in Oakland. So fusion centers are these sort of regional centers that take information from local law enforcement and they feed it up to the National Security Agency and the Department of Homeland Security. The information also goes the other way. We recently learned that the NSA can actually feed information to the National Counterterrorism Center and that information can then um, feasibly, we're not sure exactly how it works yet, but feasibly could be going to fusion centers and thus local law enforcement. So fusion centers are these centers that put out garbage reports like this one. This is from 2008. It's kind of hilarious, um, but it's also kind of kind of disturbing. Um, so it's a whole it's a whole report. Somebody um, who is getting paid tax dollars made this eight page or five page long report about anarchist ideology. Um, and they, they classified all the different kinds of anarchists because it's really important for cops to know this. Um, they, uh, and then they also threw in um, anti-capitalism. They have a piece in here about um, anti-racist action, black bloc, and cop watch even because that's what the uh, intelligence um, agencies need to be talking about. Uh, so they talk about how um, they can be dangerous. There's something that law enforcement needs to be watching out for. And uh, this is something that law enforcement and the national, uh, the national intelligence community, there's actually such a thing, it's really weird, takes really seriously. Um, and we know that uh, there was a lot of FOIA documents. As far as the Occupy movement went, um, it was classified from the very start as an anarchist protest and um, there were documents that were obtained through Freedom of Information Act requests that talked about it as an anarchist um, protest, as something that the FBI and other law enforcement agencies had to collaborate, to monitor, to be aware that violence was going to happen. It was talked about in certain terms um, and you know, something that law enforcement took really seriously. So um, the moral of the story is you're not paranoid. Uh, the government is actually watching you, but everybody here is going to talk to you about some things you can do to make their job harder. Um, so just, I just also wanted to throw in a couple of words about um, the, this stuff from the criminal defense perspective, because I'm sure lots of folks here uh, may have been to protests and may have been arrested in protests. 
Um, so I just want to want to tell you all that uh, there are a lot of things you can do to make an attorney's job easier. One of the things that attorneys see when they are defending people is pages and pages and pages of printed out text messages um, that people never deleted from their phones that say really stupid things. Uh, we also see pages and pages of printed out emails. We also know that the Oakland Police Department and other law enforcement likes to comb through Facebook and Twitter and they like to look through YouTube looking for videos of people committing crimes. In prison, that would be you know, the prison guard, the prison administration. Um, another one might be um, an abusive spouse. You, know, you, you might have people that are close to you that are threats or could be threats in the future. Um, and then, I don't think we mentioned the media, but the media can actually be a threat if they find out information that could be but they're not supposed to find out about that or that could be embarrassing to you or something. So if Google finds out that you're going to protest Google, then they can basically have their Google private security come and deal with the situation. If the police find out, then uh, they could target you for arrest or surveillance. So there's all different kinds of threats and, uh, that, that you could be facing. And uh, you can also think about the risk um, of, you know, what is the chance that the police will find out um, about the protest you're planning. Um, if you're talking amongst yourselves and not spreading information publicly, there's probably a low risk, but as the word gets out there more and people are texting about it and tweeting about it, obviously the risk goes up. So uh, with that, um, I think it would be good to talk about some of the uh, technical tools that we have at our disposal to protect our information and some of the techniques we can use. So the first thing that we want to talk about is um, passwords, or we like to talk about passphrases, um, because passwords and passphrases are what we use to protect a lot of our online activity as well as when we use our devices, like when we uh, lock our phone or, or our computer, we have a passphrase to protect it. Passwords are really important because even if you use all of these tools that we're about to point to, um, if if you have insecure passwords, you can be compromised at that point, and everything you do, end to end encryption on your email, OTR chat, um, it's all for naught if you if your computer can easily get compromised um, because you, you have passwords for your email or whatever. Um, OTR is off the record for anybody who doesn't know. Right. We will get to OTR in a little bit. Um, so basically, you want to use long, secure passwords, um, and I do want to recommend like how to create a password. So I think the most secure way to create a password is to use a password manager. Um, one of the password managers that we use is a piece of software that can store all of your passwords for you, and there are several benefits to this. One is that you are less likely to reuse your passwords because you don't have to store them all in your brain. You can have, like, I have probably 300 different passwords in my KeePass manager. KeePass X is, is the software that, that I like to use. Um, I think there are several of them out there, though. KeePass X happens to be open source. Um, there's also KeePass Droid for Android. And so, yeah, one of the benefits is that you, you're less likely to reuse passwords. And that's good because if one of your passwords gets compromised, you're using a password for Yahoo, and Yahoo gets compromised. If you're using that same password for a bunch of other stuff, whoever got that password is going to suddenly have access to all of the other. It's important to use uh, things like password managers, or if you have a really amazing brain, you can just remember a different password for each site, but I can't do that. So I would recommend using a password manager like KeyPass, which Lee's recommended, to store nice long passwords. And also, I forgot to mention, you can also auto-generate yeah. using those password managers. Um, that's all I have to say. And so it'll just make it, it'll, okay, so it'll make a really long nonsense password that is impossible for a human to remember. Um, that's probably the most secure password you can get is doing like a 25 character, just ridiculous punctuation, whatnot, stuff that is totally not pronounceable. But really the idea is that you never have to type in this password. So you wouldn't want to do that for like your computer password or possibly not even for your email password if you expect to want to access your email from a different computer um, than the one you have your password manager stored on. But for most other passwords, uh, it's fine to, to do something that's more secure. I'm recommending specifically KeePass and KeePassX because 
we think this to, this is an open source password manager, and we think this to be the best one. That doesn't mean that it's foolproof. Somebody could still find a vulnerability for key pass, or you know, there could be a pretty significant problem with it. But as, as far as we know right now, there isn't one. So that's why we recommend that one specifically. But yeah, the way to prevent that is to choose a nice, long password for key pass. And then don't write that down. Don't store that in another key pass. That one you just have to remember. But that's the only one you have to remember, which is nice. So I, for example, I have um, what I consider to be a fairly secure password on my computer. Um, I lock my computer whenever I leave it. Um, and I store my KTD file on there. I also make sure that KeePass is closed, KeePass X is closed whenever um, I leave my computer. So essentially there's, it would be very difficult for somebody to obtain the .kdd file, which is my KeePass database. If somebody were to obtain it somehow, I also have a super secure password that encrypts that .kdd file to, in order to open it. Um, so theoretically, they wouldn't be able to open it. So I, every once in a while, like I'll transfer my .kdd file on a USB drive to another computer, and there's a chance that I'll lose that USB drive, but I'm pretty confident that somebody still wouldn't be able to crack the, the file. Yes? Keypass X, Keypass, yeah, great question. It's what? Oh, way. sorry, what operating system does Keypass work on was the question. Keypass without the X was actually built for Windows and it only runs on Windows. KeePass X um, is a derivative of that and it's cross-platform. It runs on Linux, it runs on Windows, it runs on Mac OS X. Android. Uh, and KeePass Droid runs on Android. Um, okay. Uh, um, so the other thing we want to talk about is um, basically uh, secure practices with your devices, which would include your phone and your laptop and any other devices. And so, uh, one, the most important thing I would say is full disk encryption. And full disk encryption nowadays is, is an option for most of your devices. If you have, as long as you have a recent version of Android, um, all you have to do is go into the security settings and enable encryption for your storage. And that's a really important thing to do. You can do it right now. Um, it'll, it might take your phone offline for a little while because it, it has to go through and encrypt all the data and reboot, but you can do that today. Um, same thing with your laptop. You, you need to go into your uh, disk settings and enable File Vault, which is the Mac OS uh, disk encryption. This encrypts uh, all, all of your data, and you have to type in the password in order to boot up your computer. Now, don't forget the password for your for your encryption. If you do, you're screwed because, it's, as far as we know, it's, it's unhackable. So you're not going to be able to pay somebody. You know, five hundred dollars, and you know, have them like decrypt your laptop. There's just no way to do that. It's mathematically impossible. So, uh, so you need to memorize that password for real, or you need to store it in a very, very safe place and don't tell anybody where it is. What's that? Oh, right. So another thing is, uh, when you encrypt your your Mac laptop, Apple gives you an option of saving your passphrase with Apple so that Apple can give it to you if you forget it. That's not a good idea, obviously, if you're concerned about security and privacy, because you don't want Apple or anyone that asks Apple uh, to have access to that passphrase. Uh, so for example, if you are stopped at the border and your laptop is seized, they can copy all the data off of it. Even if it's encrypted, they can copy the encrypted data, and then they could ask Apple for your password, and you know, they have all the time in the world to basically decrypt that image that they, that they took from your laptop. When you're going through any kind of checkpoint or you're facing a, an arrest situation, uh, as long as you shut down your device, that encryption will, will actually protect you. If your device is on, there's a chance that somebody could use some kind of um, vulnerability to, to get access to your encryption key because they could get it off the memory of, of the device. So also, um, of course, if you're, even if you're not turning your device off, you want to have a screen lock. A situation at the long haul, which of course is a uh, local community, uh, you know, anarchist space in Berkeley. And now the authorities allege that somebody sent a threatening email from the computer lab at the long haul. And this email went to apparently some kind of UC Berkeley researcher or professor. Um, 
And uh, so the UC Berkeley police uh, started investigating this incident. And they, uh, they, the email came from a Gmail account. And so they were able to get a subpoena to order Google to hand over information about that Gmail account. And so Google, of course, routinely complies with any uh, valid legal orders like this. And so Google handed over the IP address, which is the you know, unique address on the internet that was used to send that email. And this is, the IP address is, is logged by a lot of providers that you might use, like Google and Yahoo and Hotmail and so forth. Other providers actually have policies of not logging IP addresses such as Rise Up, so that's why it's good to look to shop around and find providers that say they don't log IP addresses. But in any case, Google does log them, and so Google turned over the IP address. Um, and so then um, they determined that it was an IP address for a local internet service provider called Sonic.net. And so uh, they sent a subpoena to Sonic to find out which customer was using that IP address at the date and time that the email was sent. And so Sonic routinely complies with legal uh, orders like this, and so Sonic turned over the, the name of the subscriber, and the subscriber was the long haul. Uh, or may have been a particular person at the long haul, but in any case, they turned over all the information about that customer. And so, based on this information, the UC Berkeley police were able to get a, a warrant, and uh, they actually served a search warrant on the long haul, along with cooperation from many other law enforcement agencies like the FBI, and they basically raided the long haul and seized all of the computers and all of the data storage in the entire building. So this was like, not just computers, but anything they found that could store data like USB uh, thumb drives or hard drives or CD-ROMs or anything. And um, so everything was seized and you know packed into police cars and, and driven off. And, it, and so all the data that might have been stored on, this, on these devices was potentially compromised. So this is a great example of uh, why you might want to use disk encryption. Because if you encrypt your data, and when the police sees it, even when you're not expecting them to seize, nobody thought that the police would raid the long haul and seize every piece of data in the entire building. There's like probably five or six different organizations out of offices there. And nobody thought that would happen, but it, but it did happen. So that's just a great example of why to use encryption. There are always times when law enforcement will try to get information when they shouldn't be having access to it, when they don't legally have the right so if you make it impossible for them to get the information. A protest that I happened to be at um, a couple years ago, which was on Columbus Day in San Francisco. And um, at this protest, the police decided to crack down um, pretty viciously on, on the whole demonstration. And they uh, chased after folks and you know beat up some folks and threw them in jail. Luckily not me, but uh, many other people were arrested that day. And so the police decided to make an example of these folks that they had arrested and they uh, they held them in jail for a period of time. I don't know how long, but they, they seized all their devices. They seized their cell phones and anything else they had on them that might have any data, like cameras or anything else. And they copied all the data off of these devices. They charged these people with felonies. Um, and they, you know, they were paraded in front of the media as far as their like, mug shots and so forth. So this was kind of a big uh, political case here locally. And it's known as the ACAC 19, uh, it was the anti-colonial, anti-capitalist protest. TTDS Everywhere is a tool that the EFF um, develops and, and maintains, so of course we advocate it. Um, it encrypts your, it, well, it, it uh, encrypts whenever possible um, your web page requests. Um, it's an add-on that you can install for Firefox, Chrome, um, super easy to use. You can install it and then just forget about it for the most part. Um, we recommend, although it doesn't, it's hard to say whether it does much at this point, um, checking in your in your preferences for your browser, the do not track button. Um, we're hoping that that will do something more someday. <laughs> uh -huh. um, at least it sends a message, right, that you would not like to be tracked. <laughs> Thank you so much, we appreciate it. <laughs> um, the, I'm spacing on what else. Oh, right, the third party cookies. Um, cookies are basically, uh, any website that you visit uh, will have a tendency to store cookies in your browser, and if cookies are... Cookies sound good, but they're not on the internet. <laughs> I, so, yeah, internet cookies are not tasty uh, treats. They are a 
you can think of them as a small file that any website can store on your browser that can contain a, um, some text that can uniquely identify you. And that can uniquely identify you across any visit back to that site. Or if that site is loading up uh, images or files on other sites, then that site can see that you visited those other sites as well. So it's important to turn off third. It's important to turn off third-party cookies uh, so that uh, uh, advertisers and other malicious sorts of people cannot track you across the web. So it doesn't. Uh, I should say it doesn't. It doesn't completely prevent them from tracking you, but it's the best, easiest step that you can take. Um, and just so you know, the reason that you don't turn off cookies altogether is cookies are often quite useful for when you're to, to know that you're logged into a site. Um, it can store a cookie and give you like a, an auth ID that says that you're logged into it so that every time you make a new page request, you don't have to log in again and again and again. Um, hello? Okay. Um, all right. So let's move on to end-to-end -end encryption. Um, you can get end-to-end -end encryption um, in a lot of different communication technologies. One of them is chat. Um, with chat, it's really easy. So I imagine that some people in here might use Gmail for their chat. If you're using the Gmail web interface, um, the, your, your, your chats aren't going to be encrypted. Um, you can choose Gmail's OTR option, but Gmail's OTR isn't really what we consider to be OTR. It just means that you request that you're not logging the chat, and you request that the other person doesn't log the chat as well. It doesn't store a record of the chat on the computer. Um, OTR, the way that we think about it, is end-to-end -end encryption. And what it means is that if you initiate an encrypted chat with someone else, it's going to go through, if you're using Gmail, it's going to go through Google's servers, but Google's not going to be able to read it. Only you can read it, and only that other person can read it. A program for encrypting your email is pretty good, as evidenced by the name. Um, it's been around for, what, 20 years? And um, uh, uh, there, we, we have found very few major problems with it. Um, so the way that... Is that, oh, that's you. Um, so the way that it works is Bob is sending a message to Alice. And he writes, hello, Alice. And then he encrypts it with um, Alice's public key. Now, a public key is a file containing a bunch of numbers, a really long number, actually, one really long number, that you can give out to anyone you want. You can you could put it on your website. It's public. It's the public key. Um, and you, anybody who has this can send an encrypted message to you. Um, but nobody will be able to decrypt that message just from having your public key. To decrypt a message, so so Bob encrypts this message and sends it to Alice. Right, and it looks like this, 6EB69, whatever. Sends it to Alice, and then Alice takes their private key, and Alice can use the private key, which is another file with a really big number in it, to decrypt the message and get back hello, Alice. The way that this works mathematically is that these are, uh, these are both really big, um, you can think of these both as really big prime numbers, and it's really easy to multiply two big prime numbers and get an even bigger number, but it's really hard to then take that number and figure out exactly which two numbers were created, were multiplied together to make that big number. So you can put one number publicly, and people can use that too. So this is how PGP works. But you don't need to really know, uh, you don't need to have this internalized really to use PGP. What you need to use PGP is um, right now the best client for PGP is a thing called Enigmail, which is a plugin for the uh, Thunderbird mail client. Um, and you can set that up and start using PGP with that. Um, or there's, do we recommend mail client? Mail client? Are we recommending any of those? Okay. Um, 
There's a thing called mail pile, which is uh, supposedly good for using uh, uh, for webmail, although I'm gonna say that with the caveat that I haven't used it, so I can't give it my trust, so I'm not really endorsing it here. I'm just letting you know that it's there, but I'm not saying that I would trust it necessarily. Um, so, for the most part, we, we recommend um, using the Thunderbird standalone email app and the NMail plugin. Um, it runs on Windows, Linux, and Mac OS X. Um, and it's really, it's, I think, the easiest way to set up PGP. You install the NMail add on, it'll be in, if you go to Tools add ons in Thunderbird. You go install it. If you're on Mac OS X, you're probably not going to have a GPG program already installed. It will prompt you to install GPG Tools, which is a GPG program for Mac OS X. Once that's done installing, it'll continue through like there's a wizard. It'll continue through the wizard pro process. It'll ask if you want to create a public-private key pair or use one that you already have. Um, and when you're done with the wizard, you're ready, you're ready to encrypt email. Um, so just to be clear about the process, I, encrypt, or I create, I generate a public-private key pair. Nadia also generates a public-private key pair. If I want to, I can use my private key to sign my messages to Nadia, which if she's verified my fingerprint and knows that that's definitely me, then she can verify that, that yes, she can be assured that this email message came from Leeds. Um, if I want to encrypt an email to Nadia, I need her public key. So she also has to have some form of, uh, of processing encrypted mail, and she needs to have a public private key pair. So I'm going to take her public key, I'm going to encrypt the message with her public key, then she can decrypt it with her private key. You don't want to lose your private key. Um, it, it, you will, you do want to create a very strong passphrase to protect your private key. Read about it if you, if you don't know too much about it. Um, Tor, uh, the Tor website, what's the address? Torproject.org has a really good explanation of how it works. Um, VPN services are also good for anonymity where you can connect to a server that's a, a VPN server and then everything that you do will be routed through that VPN server so it looks like you're coming from the address of the VPN. It's also encrypted at least to the VPN. Every, your communications are encrypted at least from you to the VPN server. Um, uh, some mobile apps that we recommend are uh, Tech Secure on Android, Chat Secure on both Android and iOS. They're pretty much what they sound like. They're end-to-end -end encryption for text and chat. And there's Red Phone for Android. Is that for iOS? No, it's just Android. Um, and that's end-to-end -end encrypted voice calls. SSD.EFF.org, surveillance self-defense uh, .EFF And uh, so, the site is actually pretty out of date right now, but it still has valid information.